Good afternoon. My name is Paul Heinz. I'm the managing editor of VT Digger. Thank you for joining us for today's event, during which we will discuss the future of Vermont's congressional representation. I'd like to start by introducing our all-star panel of political experts. Uh, Lola Duffort is our political and state government reporter for VT Digger. Prior to that, Lola spent three years covering education for VT Digger and previously reported for the Concord Monitor and the Rutland Herald. She lives in Montpelier. Welcome, Lola. Thanks for having me. Liz Bankowski is a trustee of the Ben and Jerry's Foundation and serves on the boards of Green Mountain Power, the High Meadows Fund, and the Trust Company of Vermont. Though she claims she's out of politics now, Liz has, has quite a bit of experience in the arena, serving on the congressional staff of the Reverend Robert Drynan of Massachusetts, running Governor Madeline Cunin's historic 1984 campaign, and becoming Cunin's gubernatorial chief of staff. Liz also served on the transition teams of President Bill Clinton and Governor Peter Shulman. She lives in Brattleboro. Welcome, Liz. Nice to be here. Denise Casey owns and operates Casey Inc., public affairs, media, and communications firm. She also claims that she's retired from politics, but I don't believe her. Denise worked for all four of Governor Jim Douglas's gubernatorial campaigns as field director, deputy campaign manager, and twice as campaign manager. She also served in a variety of roles in the Douglas administration, including secretary of civil and military affairs, deputy chief of staff, and communications director. She later worked for the Republican Governors Association. Denise lives in South Burlington. Welcome, Denise. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. And uh, our final panelist is Julia Barnes. Uh, she is a Burlington-based political consultant who works with progressive candidates and advocacy groups throughout the country. Julia has held a number of leadership roles within the Democratic Party, including as state director of the Vermont Democratic Party. During the 2016 presidential primary, Julia served as New Hampshire state director for Senator Bernie Sanders helping him win the state 60 to 38%. And then she served as national field director for the Sanders campaign. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, happy to be here. A number of our audience members submitted questions in advance of this event, and we'll be posing them to our panel. If you come up with questions while watching, please share them in the chat on our YouTube page, and I will try to get to them. We will start by acknowledging the elephant in the room. Within the next few years, Vermont's congressional delegation is likely to look a little bit different than it does today. Senator Patrick Leahy, who's 81 years old, has said that he'll decide within the next few months whether to seek a nearly unprecedented ninth term next November. Already the fifth longest serving US Senator in history, he'd set a new record if he served out that term. Senator Bernie Sanders, who just turned 80, has served in Congress since 1991. He's up for re-election in 2024. And Representative Peter Welch, the whippersnapper of our delegation, is a mere 74 years old. He's up for re-election every two years, and he's widely expected to seek a seat in the Senate if one becomes available. Quick disclosure, I used to work for Peter Welch uh, for about two and a half years as his spokesperson uh, about a decade ago. Together, these three men have served a combined 93 years in Congress. To put it another way, I'm 37 years old, and the year that I was born, one of these men was already in the US Senate, one was mayor of Burlington, and one was minority leader of the Vermont Senate. In recent months, those of us, those of us who follow Vermont politics have been particularly focused on Senator Leahy's plans, and so have up and coming politicos. Diane Derby, who until last week served as a field representative for Leahy, wrote in a commentary for VT Digger yesterday, quote, it is apparent that there is a strong pool of congressional hopefuls waiting, some more eagerly than others, for a signal my box is a pretty clear indicator of that, unquote. So we will get right to it and ask the question that everyone is asking, and then we'll quickly move on from that question and tackle more substantive matters. Uh, Lola, why don't you start us off? What are you hearing about Senator Leahy's plans? Will he or won't he run for re-election next year? I'm generally hearing that that is unknowable at this point, although it is the subject of wild speculation uh, among Vermont politicos. Uh, I had one conversation with someone who was certain that they that you know he he would not run again, and then they called me back five minutes later with this new piece of information that they thought indicated that he absolutely would not be running, would be running. Um, and I, you know, a lot of people take him at his word when he says that uh, he hasn't decided yet, and it's very possible that Jalen to the senator himself. Julia, what are you hearing? And is your inbox blowing up much like Diane Derby's? 
Yes, uh, a lot of people are talking about this right now, but this is also the same kind of conversation that came up um, in 2018. Uh, it came up when there was a you know, slim chance that Bernie would be nominated as a labor secretary. Um, I think it's indicative that folks are uh, really interested and obviously invested in, um, in how our federal delegation shakes out. But I think the thing that the thing that I think is important and that I'm sharing with people that I talk to is that the chatter means very little at this point in time. Um, if Senator Leahy decides to run again, his continued service in the Senate will be uh, critical to any chance of retaining a functional Democratic majority in the Senate. And additionally, his leadership on appropriations means additional influence for Vermont as a state and for our values, combating climate change, dealing with the pandemic, embracing uh, economic systems that work for everybody. The sands are rapidly shifting in Washington and Senator Leahy, like most Senate Democrats are in crucial position for the country at large um, and are gonna play a critical role in uh, moving forward the extremely popular Build Back Better agenda. So I think that Senator Leahy's head is exactly where it needs to be. I think that um, his focus on the really, really important work that's happening in Washington is paramount to the speculation. Um, and I think regardless of, of how we speculate, um, you know, nobody is going to be able to determine uh, what the immediate future holds. So putting aside the question of will Leahy run, Liz, I'm wondering if you could tell me whether you think he should run or do you think that it's time for new blood in the delegation? So I approach that question as the one person here who is a boomer. And so um, uh, the conversation is very much part of my own personal life and how I've been thinking in recent years, which is much different than the way I thought five and 10 years ago. And so um, my question, not just for Senator Leahy, but also for Senator Sanders and for Congressman Welch is, when is it someone else's turn? Um, it's a really important question. And in Vermont particularly, because we only have three spots. And so I think it's interesting when, you know, when we're little kids, that's one of the first things we have to learn. <laughs> when is it someone else's turn? And it's hard. And when you're older and you're pondering, um, is it time to move away from the table, give someone else a seat? It, it, it's also hard. When is it someone else's turn? I think that this is an, I think this just has to be a part of the conversation with the three of them. And, and the reason I feel that way is we have spent recent years talking so much about the need to change our demographics. We need to bring younger people here. We need them to stay. They'll stay if they see a career path, if they see opportunity and possibilities for themselves. So this isn't only just about members of Congress. I mean, this is across the spectrum. I see this, this is a very serious discussion within the business community. There are handoffs happening. So it's, 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 we're unique here in that it's only the three spots, one house spot, and it, it you, doesn't, I don't think it exactly sends the signal we want to say that there's a lock on these seats. So, so don't, even, don't even think about it. And then the reality, again, speaking from my generation, you know, I grew up, we had television, Walter Cronkite and a few broadsheets. And what do we have now? <laughs> you know, in a very short space of time, uh, they've been so transformed. And both Generation X and the Millennials, generation, Millennials now are a larger part of our national population than the Boomers. Um, um, but right now in our workforces, even here in Vermont, we have four generations. You, you probably have the same at Digger. We have the Boomers and Gen X and Millennials and Gen Z. And age is distinctly different. It's not just a matter like, well, we're older and they're younger. They, they've been shaped by very different circumstances. The millennials have been studied endlessly. You know, it started with 9-11. Their, their sense of their own economic po possibilities weren't as great as their parents. That was a major departure. 
Um, there has been so much innovation and change on their watch. They, they've, they've reshaped the culture, they've reshaped communication, how we relate to each other. And um, they're the most diverse generation that we've seen so far. So it, you know, it just, I think this all makes a difference. Congress, on the other hand, is just getting older and older. I think the average age in the Senate now is 65. And it isn't that they can't still contribute. And it no way takes away from, you know, the many achievements of our own delegation, the pride we all have in them. Um, so my, you know, yeah, there's some good things going on. But if you step back a little bit, you have to acknowledge things are a mess. You know, the Congress. Climate is, you know, happening. Climate change is happening at a far greater rate, and it, uh, the question needs to be asked: Is is it time to really participate in a generational handoff? And in that sense, I would ask each of them: You know, when do you think it's someone else's turn? Denise, what do you think? Senator Leahy is the president pro tem of the Senate. He's the chair of the Appropriations Committee, which means that he wields tremendous power over how federal dollars are spent, uh, how those dollars make their way to Vermont. And just this year, um, he's played a part in bringing earmarks back to Congress, um, which basically means that uh, the state is probably in line for um, literally a couple hundred million dollars more than it otherwise would be in um, funding for projects that Leahy himself will select. Um, do you think that, that Senator Leahy is too big to fail? Well, so I think it's clear uh, that if Senator Leahy does move on, that the, the chairmanship of the Appropriations Committee isn't going to go to the freshman senator from Vermont. Uh, and as it stands now, as you mentioned, our other senator, Senator Bernie Sanders, chairs the Budget Committee. So th this is not a small thing. We have enormous influence in Washington, given our very small delegation uh, and the size of our state. And that is uh, as a result of the, the 10 years of our, of our delegation. But we need to be realistic. It has to change at some point, right? And so with that is gonna come a shift in power and a, a shift in influence and new leaders. And so for me, it's really just, it's a matter of when it's bound to happen probably sooner and later, and there will be changes from on. And, and that's a natural and healthy thing. You know, and Paul, we need to add to that, that Vermont gets more than it gives. We get more. You some years ago explored that question. We get more back uh, from the federal government than we give. So, and there is also, as you know, the small state kind of rule or whatever it is, where the, the small states, there's a floor. So, you know, use COVID as an example. I, I looked at some data from the Peterson Institute. You know, uh, with the two big programs, the average per capita for Vermont was $4,000 per person. The average for New York State was $1,200. So I agree that it is a huge impact. How often you get to have the chair of the Appropriations Committee, the budget, they have, there is a lot of clout. So all that has to go into the mix. But I think we also have to look at where do we stand? Any, you know, there's a lot of discussion on in Congress about the earmarks. The, uh, and, and we don't know where it's going to land. They supposedly will be very transparent. They may be limited. Um, and, you know, whoever gets elected is going to have the ability to do some of that because the whole point is then they have something to, you know, regular horse trading around votes and other things. So, so I think the whole context has to be, yeah, this comes at a time when, you know, and again, I think a, a lot of it, particularly with Senator DeLahey, but we can't reach the conclusion that we would, you know, again, given our own population dynamics and what we want to be, that we would close the door for 40 years because somebody might then get to be in that position. And let's remember how they get there. You get there by being there. You know, that's it. And your, and your party is in power. So I think it's all got to be part of their context. I just wanted to, you know, to, to your point, Liz, I 
there's this interesting awkwardness that comes up when I talk to a lot of people about the amount of money that Vermont has received in the COVID relief packages, which are you know, very disproportionate amounts compared to what other states have received because of that small state minimum, which uh, Senator Lady Leahy is credited for, which has allowed Vermont to really contemplate some really transformational changes. Um, like that money is really not trivial. It, it is a huge deal for Vermont. And it is almost certainly not something that we would have at our disposal without, um, without you know, having the chairman of the Appropriations Committee in our congressional delegation. But people feel a little bit weird about it. You know, they will sometimes ask, like, is it right that we have this disproportionate influence? Um, and you know, the reason that the Senate works for us right now is not because it is an entirely representative body. Um, and so I think there's there's some really interesting tension about you that. Know, Malou, Malou, even on that point, the, the, the uh, COVID packages also worked because the mostly, re the totally other states, small states are all Republican, Republican rural states in Vermont. And they wanted this as, as much, this is a real way for these smaller states to be protected. So, and I mean, it wasn't like an earmark. It wasn't just us. It was a group. It was the Republican states plus us all acknowledging let's let's have a good floor of protection for our states. And you know, again, I can't imagine that's going to happen again uh, anytime soon. And what a boon it was for us because we don't have enough population to raise the taxes to do all the things we're getting to do with this money. That's another way to think about it. It, it gets to, if we don't expand our own tax base and have more people participating, so great we can do these projects. But, you know, that didn't look like it was going to be possible just based on our own state revenues. And just to be a little bit more explicit about what I think Lola is getting at here, uh, those small states that are benefiting from these formulas are, uh, yes, they're, they're small, they're rural, they're also mostly white, right? And it is the larger... Um, more uh, demographically diverse states that are losing out um, due to this advantage that Vermont and other tiny states have. So um, awkward indeed uh, to hold on to that. <laughs> um, Denise, uh, Senator Leahy hasn't faced much opposition at all since I would say 1992, um, although some might disagree with me about that. Uh, when your former boss, Jim Douglas, challenged him, um, before you were involved, of course, with his campaigns, he probably would have won if you'd been working for him. Um, but even then, Leahy beat Douglas by nearly 11 points. Um, if Leahy were to choose to run again, do you think that he would draw any real primary or general election challenge? No. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I have more to say than that. But, uh, but seriously, no. Um, uh, joking aside, I, I, I think it's Leahy's decision to make. And I think it's safe to assume that Democrats, however eager they are to represent us in Washington, will hold off and not challenge him in a primary. I mean, it would be a fool's errand of epic proportions to do it. Um, similarly, as you know, there are usually Republican challengers in the general election, but as you said, none have come close um, since Douglas's challenge in, in 92. So I think no. Yeah, just to echo this, I mean, most of the, you know, really credible potential contenders have already said, I won't run if Leahy he is, um, you know, going to run again. Uh, we start off with one of the elephants in the room. To turn to another of them, our delegation has more in common with one another than their age. Uh, they're also all men, needless to say. Um, one of our audience members, Molly Turco of Norwich, wrote us the following, quote, Vermont is still the only state that has never sent women to DC. Are Sanders, Leahy, or Welch mentoring women to help ensure the next wave of legislators is more diverse? What do you think is the timeline and pathway to a woman being elected as a representative or senator? Who in the pipeline has the most potential? Um, I'll add another uh, question from Patricia of Winooski, who wrote us, quote, why has no one with the Vermont media outlet pressed, really pressed, each member of the congressional delegation on this elephant in the room question. After decades and decades of time in Congress, why haven't they made the decision to finally give up the power, prestige, 
and perks they enjoy and give women a realistic chance at getting elected to Congress to represent Vermont. Liz, you helped elect the first and to date only woman to serve as governor of Vermont. Uh, why do you think the state has had such a poor track record of electing women to statewide and federal office? And do you think that would change um, if there is an opening in the delegation? Well, you know, there are few, few on ramps. And really, in terms of Congress, there's none. We, we just talked about. Um, you know, Senator Leahy's got a lock on the seat, and as does Senator Sanders, as does Congressman Welch. And, you know, so um, on the other hand, you know, we have about, um, we're like eighth in the nation in gender equity in our legislature with about 40% of women serving. And we have a very robust pipeline. It isn't a lack of talent or ambition. There are a number of, um, potential women candidates pretty sophisticated about all this, but they, they don't have anywhere to go. And, you know, just to deviate for a minute, but it's so pertinent on this whole issue. I don't know if you heard it uh, reported on the news this weekend. There was a study just out of Tulane University, and the finding was that girls are being socialized to lose their political ambition. And it's the, the, the experiment they ran is they asked girls starting at age six to draw a picture of a political leader at work. And when they did that, 52% of them drew women. When they asked them again to do it at age 12, 25% of them drew women. So what happened? The bottom line is you can't be what you cannot see. And this is a, this is a, this is an issue we don't identify enough, the need for this change in our own state. You can't be what you cannot see. So, you know, again, we do have um, a group of women, representation does matter, true representation. It's not exactly what we've got right now. And it is, um, you know, it has to do not just with, with women, we're all in all our organizations steadfast in our determination and our uh, DEI, our diversity, equity and inclusion work. And we know it's not like enough to play lip service anymore. It's not like you can say, oh, I get it, I'm your ally. It's, it's not good enough. And I think it's the same. Um, we have a number of women, I think, it's nice to have others speak on their behalf, but they're quite able to speak for themselves. And I, I hesitate about providing a list because a list sets limitations. But I think it's so important that we highlight that we do have this robust pipeline. And I'll ask Denise to add other names, but you know, the, the obvious ones and we know them, you know, Becca Ballant, who's our Senator Pro Tem, Molly Gray, who's our Lieutenant Governor, Jill Krowinski, who's our Speaker, Keisha Rahm, who's a Chittenden County Senator, Sue Minter, Sue Minter, who who ran for governor a while ago and is the executive director of a Capstone Community Action. And then people like the a former GMP CEO, Mary, CEO Mary Powell. Um, um, so, you know, everyone I just mentioned has got sterling credentials and women's credentials usually have to be uh, the gold standard. So, um, you know, again, and Denise, uh, from your perspective, wouldn't you say also that we've got a pretty robust pool. Sure. I like lists because I think they force us to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know we'll get into this, or I hope we'll get into this a little later, but I think that campaigns are interesting enough these days um, that if a candidate is viable, even if they're not um, you know, from a, a, a list of people who've been groomed or are expected to run, they do, they can really stand a chance. Um, but that said, you know, I'll just add, add a couple of names. Um, what about um, Agency of Natural Resources Secretary Julie Moore, uh, Commerce and Community Development Secretary Lindsey Curley, uh, Governor Phil Scott has three bright women leaders um, who are very young on his senior staff, uh, Brittany Wilson, Deputy Chief of Staff, Kendall Smith, uh, who is a policy advisor, uh, Rebecca Kelly, communications, there's Jade Person Johnson as well. So these are, I, you know, I don't know about their interest in running. I've not had conversations with them. I don't think that that matters at this point. I think what really matters is that these are strong, smart, respected uh, women leaders, and it's nice to see them in public service where they can begin to see themselves as potential candidates for office. 
Well, I wonder if you could tell us what you're observing out there um, in the world of Vermont politics about um, who's, who is really actually making moves right now to prepare themselves um, for the possibility of a vacancy. We've, we've named a, a number of people um, who could be real contenders, but are you getting the sense that anyone is, is really actively uh, campaigning right now or sort of forming proto campaigns um, to prepare for the possibility that there might be a, a vacancy? I mean, I think the, the first person that people think of is, is Molly Gray, who is acting like a candidate in every way except for declaring the fact that she is a candidate. Um, I, I think Becca Ballant obviously also comes to mind. She has said that she would almost certainly run if Leahy did not. Um, and and Keisha Rahm is often also floated as a possibility. I think those are the three that are most likely to run. Um, Jill Krawinski is also, you know, considered a possible future candidate, but it's almost certain that she will not run um, for Congress, especially, or at least not in, you know, the next cycle. Julia, I'm going to uh, give you the big bucket of cold water uh, to dump on this mm. conversation, if you so choose. Um, you've worked on a lot of campaigns. Um, you know that it takes quite a bit to run for Congress. Um, money, train, sa train staff, media training, digital savvy. It's not the kind of thing that you can just, um, you know, just because your name is on a list doesn't mean that you uh, are ready for, you know, a, a pretty tough challenge. Um, so I'm wondering if you could kind of describe some of those barriers that any candidate would face um, of any gender, of any background. Um, and I wonder if you think that might whittle down the list of potential candidates. Yeah, I, thanks. I think it will absolutely whittle down the list of potential candidates. I, you know, I want to, um, you know, couch my comments by saying I think that the list that we've discussed Today that Liz and Denise brought up is a great starting point. Um, but this is, you know, running for federal office, running for Congress, whether it be Senate or uh, or the House, is, it is an undertaking of massive proportions, of which I think a lot of Vermont politicos don't have a realistic sense of what that uh, endeavor looks like. Not only does it require an extensive amount of fundraising, um, but the way that we communicate with voters is shifting really, really dramatically and even faster since the pandemic. So modern candidates and modern um, congressional candidates really need to be well versed in uh, new and um, innovative ways of voter contact. This is not the kind of race that you're going to win on lawn signs and honking waves. Um, this is a this is the type of race that you're going to have to invest real money in digital acquisition and persuasion. You're going to have to have a really well synthesized and shared brand that is going to allow voters to identify your values, particularly in a, in a crowded primary. Um, and additionally, you're going to need to find the kind of um, alliances at the national level that will help make sure. Uh, you're able to fund an endeavor that, you know, despite being a small state, is going to cost um, is going to cost a lot. Uh, so, yeah, there are going to be some real obstacles. And I think, you know, advice I would share with um, really anybody. I think we will have many women running for Congress uh, in the next couple of cycles. I think that those folks are going to need will need more donations, better political infrastructure, more national endorsers, and frankly like a campaign plan that will surpass anything Vermont has seen by leaps and bounds. Um, so what I am saying to, to everyone who is thinking about it is uh, it's time to level up your political game uh, and start thinking about how to um, how to position yourself now. And, and how should they contact you to hire you to run their campaign? <laughs> um, uh, you know, Denise, <laughs> Denise um, I, I'd love to hear you uh, elaborate on that a little bit. And I'll just note that it's been 16 years uh, since Vermont has had an open congressional seat. Um, so that was 2006. That was just a few years into the Iraq war, which was sort of a major issue at the time. Um, and campaigns have changed enormously since that time, uh, as Julia has has noted. Um, I wonder if you could tell us uh, how, how else are things different um, and, and what you think someone would need to be prepared for to run. Sure. I mean, everything Julia just said. Uh, and, you know, my, when I think about this um, uh, and what Vermonters are going to experience, it's like, hold on. You haven't seen anything yet. 
I, I mean, that, that really is the, the truth. You know, the one important point I would add to uh, what I thought was really spot on by Julia is that, you know, we are not, you know, c campaigns are not uh, determining the likelihood that you'll support a candidate any longer based on your previous voting record or whether or not you signed a petition at the Addison County Fair and Field Days. Uh, they know what car you drive. They know which credit cards you have. They know where you live. They know where you shop. They know what you like on Facebook. They know the ads you click. They know the Insta posts. I mean, th this is scary, the level of information that micro-targeting and really smart campaigns are applying. And at, just like those Facebook ads that get you to buy those shoes that were made out of water bottles, they just stalk you. Uh, with targeted information. So uh, it really, it's impossible to overstate the savvy that will be applied uh, to these campaigns and the amount of money that will pour in. Uh, consultants, you know, high, uh, highly skilled consultants are twenty five to $50,000 a month uh, just to get on board. You know, this is sort of the big time. And with the balance of the Senate uh, at stake, even though this is little old Vermont, uh, this will be a big, big race because it should be, one would think it should be a, a safe democratic seat, but they won't take anything for granted. So, you know, I would just say gone are the days of the honking waves and the milk bowl. Um, and folks are just sitting behind the computer, um, manipulating, um, compelling uh, voters uh, uh, to, to like a candidate. So one, one little bit counter thinking to that, I've never understood why you can run successfully for governor for what, 400, 500,000 now, which is a lot more, but it's gonna cost you 2 million or more to run for the same number of votes in the same, and one of the things about this is these campaigns that are driven by Washington are ridiculous. And I've seen it even play itself out here when people running bring in all the Washington consultants and all the Washington, everything you have to do and it. You're in this ridiculous situation. And oftentimes with state races, they're out of touch. So I think, yes, it'll be formidable. The money thing will be real. Um, but I, 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 I almost feel the first bit of advice I would give a, a woman candidate is don't let the Washington consultants drive what you're doing, because in Vermont, you still have to get around and do all of this. Yeah, and I, it, and I agree. And I agree to that to an absolute extent. But you're talking, there's also like a level of specialty that just doesn't exist in, oh, Vermont no, I in terms of that. what people yeah. can do. So yeah. I think that there is like absolutely an argument to be made for not centering your campaign around the ideas of Washington consultants by any means. But I will also say that um, you're going to have a hard time finding a reliable pollster that lives in oh, no, no. Um, that know, lives in Addison County. You know, <laughs> so, way back, way back when I ran a campaign, I didn't. I reached right into Boston for a top-notch political consultant. Right, it wasn't you know, and everybody does that. And there's some criticism. Why didn't you hire all Vermont? But yeah, so there's a balance. I think is the point. Yeah, yeah. There's also you also have to think about the um, the the need for. Um, investment in a modern campaign is not just about finding like a digital operation that can track you based on whether or not you bought a Prius. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also about making sure you're investing in enough people resources that you can have a real organizing team in the state. Um, you can see as many ads as you want on television or on Facebook, but the truth is, is that relational organizing and talking to your neighbors is still fundamentally the most important way for voters to be reached by these campaigns. And a good field staff and a good infrastructure is worth investing in, and it's expensive. So um, sticking with the theme of money for just a moment, um, Representative Welch, I think is, uh, like I said earlier, widely expected to run for the Senate. Um, if there is an opening, he has not said that. He's very good at dodging that question when you ask him. Um, but he's he has quite a bit of money in the bank from his uh, congressional campaigns, um, and he would be in a position to raise money really quickly given his uh, existing connections in Washington. Um, I wonder if you think that that, uh, and, and I'll direct this to you, Julia, um, to start with. Do, do you think that is? Um, uh, too much to overcome as a challenger? Do you think that Peter Welch would have too much of a leg up 
um, if he chose to run for a vacant Senate seat? Um, or do you think that he might face some real opposition from uh, those who would argue that someone who's a woman or someone who's younger um, or someone who's a person of color should be representing uh, Vermont instead in the Senate? I think that anybody that would uh, seek to challenge Congressman Welch in that matchup would have to take some serious, serious pause. Um, not only are there, um, does he already have the advantage of uh, being able to create a good pool of fundraising for his campaign, um, but he's also extraordinarily popular in Vermont. Um, he is the person that is demonstrating right now the kind of uh, values and coalition work that we need in Washington. He's doing this with the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure package. He was one of the few members who met with President Biden yesterday and has been absolutely shepherding some extremely popular legislation for a very long time, including lowering drug prices. Um, I think as uh, we we're also have to evaluate, people would also evaluate that and smart potential candidates would evaluate uh, what impact they would have, not only on the immediate race, but also on their future potential, were they to undertake um, a primary that would challenge such a popular congressman, um, also while Democrats are holding such uh, razor-thin majorities. So bottom line, I think that um, Peter Welch is so popular. Uh, he does an exceptional job uh, for Vermonters. He is the embodiment of the progressive values that I like to see in Washington, and he has the best chance of winning a contested race, hands down. Julia, I would I would just add to that. Uh, he's also the most accessible member of our yes. delegation. So uh, uh, even though he's busy, he travels to Washington, he's still um, back home uh, at least some part of most weeks. He regularly attends events when his schedule permits. He, uh, he's genuinely curious about things that are going on in Vermont. You, you, start, you see him out and about. He's responsive when there are issues that folks want to raise to him uh, in a way that our senators simply aren't. Uh, and so yes. I think that that's another uh, distinguishing factor for Congressman Welch that will play very well, whatever he decides to do. Agreed. He's a, oh. he's a testament to his office. And I think um, anyone who is looking to make their way to uh, Washington um, would be wise to, to give it serious pause uh, if it meant going up against Congressman Welch. I'll just play devil's advocate for a moment, because uh, I think that uh, much of what you guys have said, I would agree with. But, um, you know, though he has served in Congress for six, 16 years now, plus 16 years now, uh, he has not faced a real campaign in all of those years. Um, and uh, arguably, he's he has perhaps forgotten how to campaign hard um, in that time. Do you think that would be a challenge for him, or do you think... Um, uh, that wouldn't really matter. And I'll put that question to Liz. I don't know. You know, I I just, again, with everything that preceded this, there's so much pent up talent, ambition, people who don't see themselves in the picture, want to be seen in the picture. I'm not so sure someone wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, all, all the reasons given why it would be so formidable and so like, are you crazy? I, I, um, I, you know, because we're back to saying that they, we, we, there are there people get a lock on these seats, so don't you even dare think about it. And you know, I'd like to see the reverse happen. I'd like to see yeah, I, live yeah, I, primary. I'd like to see everybody get into it. I'd like to see Curtis Reed from my part of the world, um, um, a black Vermonter who's done more in the schools and with the police and created. I mean, I'd like to see. I'd like to see them all get in it. It would be good for our state. So there are yeah. all those reasons why you know don't even think about it. I, I you know again, it's the benefit of being old now. I. I, I would encourage people to think about it. What have you got to lose? That's what I always tell candidates. What have you got to lose? Just that you lose, big deal. You went around the state, you got to meet a lot of great people, you had wonderful conversations. So at the end of the day, if you really feel like I just need to put myself out there, I wouldn't discourage people from doing it. I just, I just want to be clear. My argument is not that people shouldn't think about it. And I think I agree with you, Liz, that it would be absolutely wonderful for us to see new representation in Vermont. The reality of, 
a potential contested primary against Peter Welch really does paint an extremely clear picture. This is a logistical undertaking with an extraordinarily popular and, as Denise said, accessible politician who absolutely emb embodies the values of Vermont. So the question is, when is the when does leaning in actually allow you to take advantage of the situation? My point here is that I think is that situation is not going to be tend to people's advantage. Doesn't mean folks can't try. Just realistically and logistically, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, Lola, I'm going to ask you this question first, and then I'll go to Denise with the same question. It's from Aiden Wilson of Newport. Um, and Graydon writes, quote, Governor Phil Scott has previously said that he does not have any interest in running for a congressional office, whether in the Senate or the House. If Pat Leahy declines to run next year, what is the likelihood that Governor Scott will throw his hat in the ring? Well, what is your uh, what's your hot take on that one? Again, I think it's not knowable whether or not he will run. I think he would face enormous pressure to run uh, from national Republicans because he would stand a good chance of winning. Um, I mean, there was one poll from a few months ago that showed him in a, um, you know, basically statistical tie in a head to head race with Leahy himself. Um, he is an enormously popular uh, governor. Obviously, it would be very hard for him to figure out how to position himself against the argument that electing him would hand the Senate over to Mitch McConnell. I think that that would be, um, you know, an, an extraordinarily difficult argument to make in Vermont. Um, but I think he will face enormous pressure to, to run. And that if he did, obviously, he would receive enormous support from, from the RNC. So Denise, uh, I want you to answer that question. I'll also add a little bit more to the question, if you can remember it all. Um, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll note, and, and I think it was Liz earlier who mentioned that um, that Vermonters do tend to elect Republicans to serve as governor, um, but the last Republican that Vermonters have elected to Congress was Jim Jeffords in 2000. Um, and by the year 2000, Jim Jeffords wasn't really much of a Republican anymore um, and formally left the party a year later. Um, what specific challenges do Republicans face when running for federal office in Vermont, um, in addition to the Mitch McConnell argument that Lola mentions? Sure. So, okay, there are a bunch of parts to this. Um, uh, so first, you know, there isn't a question in my mind that uh, Washington, D.C. couldn't benefit from a leader like Phil Scott. That said, I think it's highly unlikely uh, he would run. He said as much. Um, he tends to say what he means. Um, something could change, but he's been pretty clear so far. Um, the fact is, though, a Republican is going to have a really hard time with a congressional or Senate race. You know, federal office is very different from uh, leading as a governor. Governor is an executive leader. Vermonters are looking for somebody who can run things. When we think about Congress, we think about political values and positions and issues like the reproductive rights, health care policy, judicial appointments, even the question of who are you going to caucus with? Are you going to caucus with the Republicans? Would be a, a, pose a huge, huge hurdle for a Republican candidate. And you know, you mentioned 2006, the last time there was a truly contested race for Congress. We had General Martha Randall challenge then State Senator uh, Peter Welch. This is the first woman to serve as an adjutant general in the country. Uh, a moderate, a decorated military leader, yet that campaign, uh, I mean, I, I, I remember it very acutely. That campaign was not about her record, her resume, her experience, her leadership skills, her qualifications. It was a campaign about the federal, you know, the national Republican Party platform, which happens to be at a step with most Vermont voters. It's just a fact. Uh, and so she really struggled in that campaign, despite, you know, being a, a really incredibly uh, strong candidate. So, you know, again, uh, running a campaign uh, for a Republican for federal office is just not going to be about uh, your um, uh, experience. It's going to be about the National Republican Party platform. And, and that is a massive hurdle for anyone, including uh, Governor Phil Scott, to clear. 
I'm going to take another question from our audience. Um, Elizabeth Deutsch, hopefully I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, um, writes, quote, Joe Crowley had as much power as Peter Welch, um, uh, as Peter Welch does, excuse me, um, but he fell to AOC. Um, why do we act like Lynn cannot be significant, uh, not be a significant, sorry, not be a significant powerful politician if there is a male politician ahead of her in line? Uh, hopefully you caught that question despite all of my fumbling around. Julie, do you want to take that one on? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that that is the argument, quite frankly. I think that um, we are, there are plenty of uh, Vermont women, and especially the women that have been named tonight, that will absolutely be formidable um, federal uh, federal elected officials. The comparison between Joe Crowley and and, and Peter Welch is um, is kind of apples to oranges. Joe Crowley was uh, a incredible centrist who didn't even live in his district, um, and uh, whose campaign uh, utilized some incredibly uh, underhanded and lightly racist attacks against Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and her her first race. Um, I don't think that that's a brush that we would paint uh, Congressman Welch with by any means. I'm going to stick with you for another moment, Julia. Uh, one of our viewers um, right, named Sam, I don't know where Sam is from, uh, nor what Sam's last name is. Sam writes, Julia, as a progressive, what progressive female candidates do you see as potential front runners? Um, I think that this goes to the bigger question of whether or not um, a, a capital P progressive um, could, uh, could run for Federal, federal office. I think that there are some wonderful progressive um, women leaders in uh, in the state. Um, Selena Colburn is the first one that comes to mind when I think about it. Um, but the distinction is of progressive versus Democrat is less important in my mind federal race. Uh, if we're talking about the progressive party of Vermont as it exists now, I think it would be very hard for them to summon the infrastructure to lift a candidate to federal office. I also think that our Vermont Democrats have the values in Washington that match where the Congressional Progressive Caucus are, where the Democrats on the left are, uh, and the differentiations exist here in the state and not necessarily in D.C. I think that's important when you're talking about running for federal office. I think that distinction is important. Additionally, on the spectrum in Congress, a progressive and a Democrat would be in the same caucus. It's it's a, just a differentiation of parties we have here in the state. And logistically, I think a Democratic nominee would have many resources to rely on in a contested race that would not be available to a progressive. I also think some of the success we've seen of progressives running for statewide office has been based on the alignment with the Vermont Democratic ticket. And I don't think that you would see that kind of collaboration if you were talking about a contested primary. That being said, um, I do think that it's really important for us to have a, a spectrum of views uh, in these in potential primaries. Um, and as we talk about the future of the federal delegation, I would absolutely want to um, have somebody in discussion who um, was in the conversation left. That's my my personal political preference. I also wonder whether the conversation might be a little bit different in 2024 if Senator Sanders were to retire at that time, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but um, you know, obviously as, as probably, um, not probably, as the most prominent progressive, lowercase p progressive in the country, um, I would imagine that there would be significant, um, a significant movement within Vermont to ensure that he was succeeded by someone equally progressive. Um, but I wonder if maybe that wouldn't be as much of a factor uh, if, if Leahy were the first one to retire, um, but who knows. Uh, I'm gonna turn to one other reader question for now. Uh, David Delaney of Burlington asks, quote, do you see a potential Tim Ash comeback as plausible? Uh, Tim Ash, of course, is the former Senate President Pro Tem from Burlington, um, and he uh, lost in a primary uh, for Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray last year. Um, Lola, I'm going to just expand on that question a little bit before turning it over to you. Uh, there are a number of male politicians in their 40s and 50s um, who've climbed the political ladder sort of in the traditional manner and who a decade ago, um, I think, would be seen as, as pretty obvious congressional contenders. So ones that um, jump to my mind, at least, are people like Attorney General T.J. Donovan, uh, former Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, who ran for governor last year, former House Speaker Shap Smith and uh, Tim Ash. Um, do you think that they're out of the running due to their demographics? Um, or do you think that 
we could see some of them uh, playing a role in these races as well. I don't think they are going to play a role in this next cycle in terms of the congressional races. I think TJ Donovan is widely seen as a potential contender for the um, for the governor's office, uh, but he has indicated he's not interested in Congress um, and has also said that he would like to see a woman run. I don't think that being male precludes any of these men from running and even potentially winning one of these races, but I think it just makes it more awkward, right? Because it is a stated value of their party now to see more female representation. So it's, it is a question that they will have to answer and, um, and it could be a difficult question to answer, but I, I don't think that it knocks them out of the running. Julia, most years there is not a lot of competition for statewide offices in Vermont. Um, trying to remember when you were running the Vermont Democratic Party, you probably went through a couple of lean years when there when there was not uh, that much going on. Um, but a vacancy at the top, like a U.S. Senate seat or a governorship, um, can really open things up and trigger a whole lot of down ballot races. Um, the last two times this happened in Vermont was in 2010. Uh, and 2016, uh, both times there was an open uh, governor's seat and uh, there ended up being a, a whole bunch of pretty pet races. Uh, what would that look like in 2022 if there were to be a vacancy? And I, I would anticipate we would see something close to a very polite free-for-all. Um, I think that uh, that on top of the potential shifts for federal office, there's an open question about what happened in the governor's race, whether there would be any retirements, whether current politicos who would be a good fit for down ballot races would throw their hat into, federal, uh, into a federal primary um, and forego the opportunity to, uh, to potentially step into statewide office. Um, I can't speculate on who's gonna do what, but I would say that anybody thinking about a statewide race or a down ballot position in Vermont could have a, a, a really opportunistic 2022 to get there. And, um, you know, my universal advice is start getting your ducks in the row, uh, because if it's not a cycle, it may be the next one. Um, and, uh, and I think that folks, folks should be ready. Lola, uh, I think it's plausible that if there's a vacancy, next year, you could see the sitting Senate President Pro Tem, the sitting Lieutenant Governor, um, and a number of sitting state legislators uh, running for higher office during the 2022 legislative session. Uh, how do you think that would affect legislative business? Well, I think it'll be a lot of fun to watch. We'll see, obviously, a lot of posturing. I think something to keep in mind, too, about the way that Vermont legislates that it has two year bienniums, right? So two year legislative sessions. And quite often the hardest stuff gets uh, punted to the second year. And we're coming up on the second year of our biennium. And that is going to co coincide with what could be a really massive uh, election year where we have all of these people, you know, finally vying for seats that, that, you know, are open for the first time in a long time. And so we're see these two things converge, which is all of the hardest conversations happening at the same time as everyone is running for office. Um, and I, I think that's going to have profound impacts on what does and does not get through. Something that has been flagged for me by multiple people is the fact that we have punted a conversation about a pension overhaul to next year. Um, and I wonder what the likeliness that something that difficult makes it through if so many people are trying to be elected. Um, you know, these are the kinds of grand bargains that require making a lot of people angry um, and a lot of people in your base angry, potentially. So it is going to have a profound impact um, on the legislative session and it could be pretty, pretty chaotic. We have time for just a couple more quick questions and then we have to wrap up. Um, I'll take one more from an audience member, Audrey from Hardwick, uh, writes, quote, what is the concern for Phil Scott appointing a replacement if Leahy were to not be able to finish his term, um, assuming that he runs in 2022? Uh, I guess this is, this is assuming two things. 
assuming a couple of things um, uh, that uh, that Leahy does run, that that Scott runs for another term, which I don't think is a given either, um, and that both of them win. Uh, but certainly, it's something that that got quite a bit of attention um, in uh, after after President Biden was elected, uh, because. As I think it was Julia who alluded to earlier, the fact that Senator Sanders um, campaigned pretty hard to be the Secretary of Labor, the U.S. Secretary of Labor, um, and had he been successful, um, Governor Scott would have appointed his successor in the Senate at least temporarily. And I'll, I'll just my I want to make sure I get my election law right here. So correct me if I have this wrong, but I believe the way it works is that uh, the, the governor in Vermont at least can appoint a temporary replacement until a special election is held. Um, and at that time, I think as soon as that election is over, um, the person who wins takes the office. So this would be really a temporary uh, situation, but the Senate is split 50-50. Um, so uh, who wants to tackle that one? Denise, do you want to give that one a whirl? I just had a feeling you would say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's something to think about. I think the likelihood is probably low. Um, I think it is, I mean, I guess it is possible that Senator Leahy would run again and not finish his term for whatever reason. Um, but again, I, I think it's pretty low. And what will happen is the governor will appoint um, uh, an, you know, an interim um, member of the Senate. And just thinking about the governor's temperament and uh, his approach to things, I think uh, it would be um, probably uh, unlikely that he would select someone who dramatically um, opposed Senator Leahy's agenda or uh, or approach to things? I, I just don't see that happening. So again, I see I see it as a potential disruption, um, but not a significant one. I think it's funny that that was brought up by one of our uh, listeners because this is actually one of the rumors, and I want to emphasize that it is a rumor. <laughs> Maybe it's highly implausible, but one of the rumors floating around in Vermont politics right now is that Leahy may actually run again, but then step down in two years once he's, you know, appropriately groomed a successor and he'll time this to, you know, be in line with the presidential race yeah. so that this isn't happening during the midterms. Um, but again, I want to emphasize this is not meaningful information. It is. It is <laughs> That's some serious galaxy brain kind of yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> From people who I think are spending a little bit too much time, <laughs> more time even than we are, uh, pondering these questions. Um, I would uh, like to end on this note. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, although I'm not going to ask Lola this question, uh, because Lola is a, an unbiased reporter with no thoughts or feelings or uh, lived experiences that could possibly affect her work. Uh, but I'll ask the, the other three of you, um, what do you want to see next year? Um, what would be um, an ideal uh, turn of events, um, if I could ask that question? Um, and Denise, I'm going to throw this at you. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to throw this at you first. Sorry for the curveball, but what do you think? What do you want to see next year? So, I mean, I think like anyone who cares about uh, the future of our country, um, you know, some kind of election that reflects uh, the kinds of leaders that, you know, we need to see in Washington is what I I'm looking for. And, you know, I will say that I, I think we have been well served in so many ways by, by our delegation. We've talked about a, a bit of this now, um, but I, I will just say maybe as the resident moderate um, that we, we need bipartisanship. We need compromise. I know some people think that's a four letter word, um, but we need it and we need to be able to make progress. And so when I hear people sort of talking about, um, you know, exasperated by the sort of state of affairs, and then they make these really hopefully partisan comments, it's just sort of like, okay, it's more of the same. So uh, for me, I'm looking for a leader that will, you know, bridge divides, march towards progress and be willing to take slings from the pundits on cable news um, and make it happen. Julie, you're up next and then Liz. I think regardless of what decisions are made by either Senator Leahy or Senator Sanders about their future, I'm looking at this from what I am experiencing right now. Um, currently, 
the climate in Washington around um, really critical and extremely popular funding that is going to be absolutely life-saving and life-changing for people in this country is um, is being held hostage under the name of uh, under the name of compromise. Um, and so, what I want to see happen is I want to make sure that we continue to be served by a delegation that holds very, very fast to our values um, and to the values of Vermonters, which uh, are um, values of equity, values of justice, values of fairness. Um, and I think that uh, that we have been served immaculately by our delegation. And I am uh, so proud that our tiny little state has managed um, to forestall uh, so much disaster in Washington just by the folks who are um, who are representing us. I'm so grateful for that. Um, and if uh, if our delegation decides that it's time um, that it's time to step down, I am really looking forward to a, a uh, engaged and enthusiastic um, primary for for a lot of women in the state. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Liz, what do you want to see next year? Well, I I'll end with the question I started with. I started with. When is it someone else's turn? It's someone else's turn. So I would hope to see that we would, um, that would begin to happen in the state. All right. I thank each of you for joining us. Hello, Julia, Denise, Liz. Um, I uh, also want a couple of people who've been, who've been working behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, Dari, Libby Johnson, uh, Libby Sparadeo, and to our audience, thank you so much for joining us and for sending in really great questions. Please keep reading VT Digger. Please keep supporting our journalism and everybody's journalism. And uh, we'll see you out there on the trail possibly next year or two years after that or six years after that. All right, thanks everyone, good night. Thanks, good night. everybody. <laughs> thank you.